This is Optimal Finance Daily, episode 30, How I Became Financially Independent in Five Years, part three, by Jacob Lund Fisker of EarlyRetirementExtreme.com. Get ready to maximize your potential with Optimal Finance Daily, the podcast that brings you the best content in personal finance five days a week. Your optimal life awaits. Now here's your host, Dan Warren. Greetings, everybody, and a happy Friday to you. Welcome back to Optimal Finance Daily, where I read to you from some of the best personal finance blogs on the planet. It's really that simple. We go out and find the best personal finance advice and put it into podcast form. If you have any topic requests, anything you'd like to hear, any authors you'd like to hear from, come visit oldpodcast.com and share those with us. And today is the final installment in uh, what I guess you could call a trilogy, three episodes in a row focusing on Jacob from Early Retirement Extreme. I read the first two parts of Jacob's remarkable story yesterday and the day before. So make sure you check out episodes 28 and 29 if you are a new listener and just trying us out for the first time. Those episodes cover more of Jacob's story and how he's been able to become financially independent and retire at the ripe old age of 33. So let's continue the story and start optimizing your life. How I Became Financially Independent in Five Years, Part 3, by Jacob Lund Fisker of EarlyRetirementExtreme.com. Having just graduated with a PhD and paired everything I could possibly need into a couple of large suitcases, except for my humongous book collection, I moved to my new job. With everything in a couple of suitcases, it's quite easy to move. It takes maybe a couple of hours to pack and clean the place, and off you go. I had also made sure not to exceed the airline weight limit for either suitcase to get the added freedom of flying with my stuff and not paying for excess weight. Prior to my arrival, I had decided that after four years of sharing a kitchen and bathroom with 18 other people, I wanted the luxury of my own kitchen and my own bathroom. Luckily, I found such a room on the top floor of a house, which the landlord rented out to visiting students and researchers. This was within walking distance of my new job, so I was good to go. Groceries were acquired during lunch breaks by hauling a messenger bag over to the nearest supermarket, which unfortunately was in the opposite direction. I kept eating like I used to. One problem was that I hadn't moved my bank accounts, so after a week of eating out with my new boss, etc., I was down to a couple of cans of tuna, a large bag of rice, and some soy sauce for the second week until I got my paycheck. I suppose I could have gotten a payday loan, but I was used to eating simple, so eating rice three times a day for a couple of days was no big deal. After all, most of the world does just that. Shortly after that, I got the bank connections in order, but I did learn an important lesson. It does not matter how much money you have if you cannot buy food. Second, if you can rough it a little, you have choices. For instance, I could attend to the social arrangements for my new job, the cost of having a job, even though I didn't really have money to eat. It was shortly thereafter that I met DW, who in addition turned out to work just a couple of buildings over from where I worked. After the incident at the karaoke bar, Dating comprised mostly of hanging out at either her place or my place. After several months of dating like that, we decided that we might as well move in together. After having looked around, we found a nice little house for rent within walking distance of our work. In my case, walking distance usually means less than four miles, but this house was less than two miles away, had a huge backyard, and was located in a quiet neighborhood just at the edge of the city. Nice. At $660 a month, it was hard to beat except for the $400 apartment we found later just before we moved to California. Of course, since the house had been empty for a couple of years prior, everything, and I do mean everything, started failing in short succession just after we moved in. The nice thing about renting, though, is that the landlord is usually responsible for maintaining the appliances. DW was used to eating more varied than I was, so I gave up my lazy Spartan diet, figuring that I could afford the luxury given that I now had a real job. Besides, not eating lentil soup six days a week, interspersed with tuna sandwiches, seemed to be worth the $70 increase in food expenditures. I mean, in 30 years, I might not have any taste buds left to appreciate the $700 of monthly food money that this increase would compound into. We got most of our furniture used. Some of it was donated from people at our workplace, moving on to better things. Other things, we bought used. We also bought a few crappy particle board pieces new. You generally get what you pay for unless you buy used. In that case, you tend to get a lot more than what you pay for. When we moved, we free cycled a lot of our furniture and sold other furniture. On a net basis, I don't think we paid anything for the furniture that did not come with us. 
Buying used often means that depreciation costs are fully factored in, so effectively, we got free use of a lot of that furniture. Being normal, DW had a car, even though we lived, worked, and shopped practically the same places even before we met. It's been a subject of continuous debate ever since whether to keep it or not. One thing I noted was that I could get from our house to my office in 30 minutes by walking. Going by car, I could get there in about 20 minutes. Running, I could get there in 10. Thus, often I would simply take off on foot before DW got the car defrosted, etc., and we would arrive at the same time. Eventually, I bought a used bike for $35 from a professor who was leaving for California. I ran that bike into the ground, but it was worth it, given that I could make the trip in 10 minutes instead of 30 minutes. Of course, the bike was useless during winters. Sometimes I would brave the cold, minus 17 degrees Fahrenheit, and walk through the snow, which was conveniently thrown onto the sidewalk. Walking was passively discouraged in the city we lived in. One might say that citizens were not particularly enlightened. One resident explained to me that the reason that there weren't any more sidewalks was because the voters believed that sidewalks would provide poor people with an easy way of getting around. Yes, and... Well, clearly, poor people that otherwise could not afford a car are mostly criminals. Huh? Read that one again if that did not make sense the first time. It still doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, But I guess there was something to it as I once got held up by a campus police cruiser, spotlight in my face and the loud voices from a conversation at 30 feet, I couldn't see a thing, while walking home from work. He probably thought I was casing the bank I just walked by, but I eventually managed to convince him that that was my standard route for walking to and from my job. Next day, I got a ride from him while walking to work. He was probably trying to make up for the episode the night before. I also got well-intended, albeit naive, advice from people I passed on the campus parking lot, ranging from how I should dress for the weather to questions from strangers about where I got the nice gear. So I kept walking, although I must admit that I did get a ride from DW when the weather was particularly bad or when I was particularly lazy. Meanwhile, savings kept going up, but at this point, I was starting to think about investments. These are the topic of part four. You just listened to the post titled How I Became Financially Independent in Five Years, Part 3, by Jacob Lund Fisker of EarlyRetirementExtreme.com. As I mentioned in the previous episodes, I have been reading you the first three parts of Jacob's story, so if you'd like to hear about his investments, which, as he mentioned, is covered in Part 4, you will have to visit him online, where you can find tons of valuable information, and that website, again, is EarlyRetirementExtreme.com. And while you are out there on the net, stop by our home base at oldpodcast.com to show your support for this podcast if you like what you hear. You can join our free weekly newsletter to get a couple of gifts right off the bat. Plus, you'll be entered to win a book each and every month just for being part of the family. So again, come on by oldpodcast.com to join. If you prefer to text, you can text the word financial to the number 44222 for an even faster way to join. Again, Text the word financial to 44222. And that wraps up week number six of the Optimal Finance Daily Podcast. I hope you did enjoy our special three-part feature this week, and I will be back on Monday with our usual selection of authors. So have a great weekend. I'll see you next week where your optimal life awaits. Hello, Life Optimizer. This is Justin Mollick, creator and producer of this podcast, but also Optimal Living Daily the show where I read to you from even more blogs covering finance, productivity, minimalism, personal development, and more from amazing bloggers like Derek Sivers, Zen Habits, The Minimalists, and all the ones you hear on this show too. So if you enjoyed today's episode and like taking amazing blogs on the go, come on over to Optimal Living Daily and subscribe to that one too. And together, we'll start optimizing your life. You've been listening to Optimal Finance Daily. Be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on each new episode and head to oldpodcast.com. That's oldpodcast.com for a free gift as well as more actionable tips and resources to help you maximize your potential. Thanks for joining us. And remember, your optimal life awaits.